welcome to all of you on today's Awaken Talk with Dr. Arun Sharma. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining from across the world. Thank you very much for joining us today on Awaken Talks. Awaken Talks is an online platform where fortnightly we converse with change makers who inspire us and who work at the intersection of outer work as well as inner work. In another circle, for the last few months, we've been reflecting upon the initial chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which is Arjun Vishad Yoga. And I was just thinking of how in Awakened Talks, our guests are such who synthesize their Vishad or despondency into yoga, which is synthesis and synchrony. There is a lot of strife in the world. Outwardly, there is sickness, there is difficulty, there is misery. And all of that is reflected in the human mind too. But then there are people who, through the experiments with their life, strive to draw some synchronization with the inner laws of nature and convert this despondency into yoga, into synthesis. Awaken Talks is a platform of conversations with such individuals who can inspire us through the journey of their lives. Thank you very much for joining us on this Awaken Talks. And I would like to state that the audience is free to post their comments on the Awaken Talks page on the Service Space portal. Or if you want to ask a question to Dr. Sharma, you can post the question through email at ask at servicespace.org ask at servicebase.org. Towards the end of this call in the last 30 minutes, we will take some questions from the audience and direct it to Dr. Sharma. So feel free to ask your questions to Dr. Sharma. We would now pause for a minute for all of us to slip into a minute of silence as we allow ourselves to soak in to the present moment. So please allow us to slip into a minute of silence and come back in a minute. Tumamangani Vakprana Chakshu Shrotra Matho Balamindriyani Chasarvani Sarvam Brahmo Panishadam Maham Brahmanira Kuryam Mama Brahmanira Karo Anira Karanam Astu Anira Karanam me astu tadatmani nirateya upanishat sudharmaha. Te mai santo, te mai santo. Om shanti 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 hari om shri guru pyo namaha hari om. A 
A warm welcome to all of you joining from across the country and the world. And a note of gratefulness for Dr. Arun Sharma, who made time to speak to us this morning. Uh, as we start this conversation, a brief introduction is due to Dr. Arun Sharma. He is the founder of IMANAH, which is International Institute of Mahayoga and Natural Hygiene. Dr. Sharma is a doctorate from Indian Institute of Natural Therapeutics. And he's actually a keeper of the flame. His grandfather, Acharya Lakshman Sharma, wrote a treatise on nature cure all the way back in 1933. It was titled Practical Nature Cure. And it was his tribute to this stream of, I would say, science that had its root in Indian scriptures. Much before that, Dr. Sharma's grandfather, Acharya Lakshman Sharma, was a freedom fighter. He was a practicing lawyer who gave up his practice to join Mahatma Gandhi's call of giving up any kind of service which could help the government of the day. But he was also a student of the Vedantic literature and towards the end of the life, before he gave up his mortal body, his last work was Vedant Saram. And despite such a rich body of work, he was also a devotee of Bhagwan Raman Maharshi, and he helped translate many of his works from Tamil to Sanskrit and to English. <coughs> and yet, much of his work remained defined by his study and his expertise in nature cure. He also wrote a 1500 slok, Swadhin Swastya Mahavidya in Sanskrit, which spoke of uh, various intricacies of nature cure. His son, Ganesh Sharma, took this legacy forward and uh, took it to the towns and small villages of Tamil Nadu as to how can this be put into practice. In fact, he said, uh, Ganesh Sharma said that the real revolution of nature cure will begin in the humble kitchens of people's homes. So it's not something which is far-fetched, but it's something which will start in our own kitchens. Food will change the way in which we heal and we make our bodies. Dr. Arun Sharma is a keeper of this legacy. And while he is at a ripe age of his late 70s, his energy beats a lot of people even half his age. For the last 50 years, he has spread this message of nature's health, nature's hygiene through various camps. At the beginning of his life, he experimented with farming and a few other businesses, but ultimately he landed on his, if I may say so, family business of nature cure. And I mean that not in the limited sense of his own family and his own lineage, but the family of this entire earth in the sense of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, who could benefit from this knowledge of nature cure, of being in alignment with the laws of nature. So behind Dr. Arun Sharma is his lineage and his own five decades of experience in integrating the health of not just the body, but also of the mind and spirit, and also integrating both occupation and creativity. Also integrating and synchronizing compassion and livelihood. And it is this rich body of work uh, and, and this, this tradition keeps going forward. His kids, as well as grandkids, I have seen a video, a YouTube video of his grandchild making a salad, right? So that's something which continues. He ba he's based out of the US and yet he spends a lot of time in India spreading the word on nature cure, on, of nature hygiene and nature's health science as he prefers to call it now. So this is in a nutshell, the kind of work that Dr. Sharma has been doing. He speaks, um, he speaks and illuminates the creative intelligence that is in the body, in the human body, which helps it not just heal, but actually makes full use of the potential of the human body, which is a gift, the gift of life 
that we've all been given. So thank you, Dr. Sharma, for giving us your time, a slice of your life. And thank you for all the work that you've been doing, the precious work that you've been doing all your life. And uh, I would like to open this conversation with you to ask you a bunch of questions regarding your body of work. One is, of course, what is this nature's health science? Because we keep hearing of nature cure, but we probably don't know the innate workings behind it. So what is it? Question number two would be, what are the principles that underline this nature's health science? And uh, yeah, so these are the questions we would like to ask you. What exactly is disease and what exactly is health? If you could expand upon that uh, in line with the work that you've been doing all your life, it would be a great introduction of your life and work to this audience. Welcome again, sir. Thank you. I'm so glad to be among you all. So such intellectuals and spiritually oriented audience. It's a great opportunity for me to share a few little thoughts that I have. And this is an ocean. We, any amount of water you take out of it, it never drains. It will drains the ocean. So whatever little I am talking here about is just a beginning to know the uh, vast information that is still there to learn. In spite of spending so many years in, in the, among people who are health lovers, I have seen that there is still things to learn. I learn from every student, every patient, different information that's necessary to make this go forward. And that's how our approach should be. If we go with the approach that I know everything, that's the end of your journey. We cannot progress. So I have seen that every patient has given me information by which we can deal with other patients in a better way. So when I say patient, it also means when you take to nature cure, you be patient. No, don't be impatient. Nature takes its own time like a blooming of a flower. If you see a bud of flower and you say, okay, come on, bloom. It doesn't bloom like that. It takes its own time, sweet time to bloom into a full flower. When it does, it's a wonderful sight to see. So it's the same journey with improvement of health. Uh, spirit, psychologically, physiologically, spiritually, there are so many definitions of what is health. In this audience, I will just say the uh, definition that comes to me today, but it can be broken down into simpler languages at a later time. Health <clears throat> is a sum total of our physical, fitness, mental enthusiasm, and spiritual detachment to the results of our actions. This may look complicated, but that's what it is. Health is the sum total of our physical fitness, mental enthusiasm, and spiritual detachment to the results of our action. So this is a strange thing. It is not un, it's unheard of, but what are, in simple terms, let's come back to what is health. Pranasya nirmale dehe cheshtitam swasthya namakam Pranasya samale dehe chetitam roga namakam. Life's activity in a clean body is called health. Life's activity in an unclean body is called disease. That's all there is to it. Life is all the time struggling to make our body cleaner and healthier. In the effort, when there is accumulation of too much filth in our body, the body has to take extra near extraordinary efforts to clean it. This extraordinary effort also gives us warning not to eat any food until the cleaning job is done. Because when you put food in the body, the top priority of life is to digest the food. Don't worry about cleaning, let's digest the food. If we don't digest the food immediately, the food will rot. Rotten food will create more disease, more problems. So the priority of life is to digest the food. So the wrong idea people get 
that food is a source of energy. Without food, we cannot live. All those ideas will be entertained. Because when you eat food, the cleaning process is stopped, body pains stop, and the tired, tiresomeness goes away, and you feel fresh eating food. Some people think food is a source of energy. It is not so. It's only a detachment from the other world. You have pulled the life energy to take care of digestion. So the cleaning work is stopped and the body pain goes away and tiresomeness goes away. And we think food as the source of energy. Whereas to prove that food is not the source of energy, we have to continue fasting even if there is a pain in the body. When you continue fasting, after some time, the cleaning work is finished and the strength comes back with no pain in the body. Unless you go to that extent of trying it out, you cannot see the truth. The truth is farther away. You have to wait and see, open it up and see, take time. When we look at life itself, life is full of opportunities. In this opportunity, we have to work towards better life all the time. We should live in a manner, that, like Kabir says, if we live in a manner that when we leave this body, when, when we are born in this body, they say, Kabira, jab hum paida hue, Jag hase hum roe. Then keep do when you are born, when a boy is born in the family, everybody is so happy celebrating it. And this boy is crying when he came into this world. And Kabir says, lead your life in, the, in such a way that when you depart from this life, people should cry that such a noble soul has departed. Aisi karni kar chalo, hum hase jag roe. Do such good deeds in your life so that you go smiling. You don't cry because you are dying. You go smiling happily, comfortably, peacefully. And when you go smiling, the whole world should cry that such a noble soul has left this world. Life is an opportunity. When problems come, we go break down. We should not break down when the problem comes. When the problem comes, it only means this is an opportunity to solve this problem. Even this will pass, they say. How does uh, every problem become positive? How does every problem become useful ingredient for you to come up in life? By seeing the reality, that's all. The reality of disease is that it is trying to make your body healthier. This ease or lack of ease is because of the body engaging itself in cleaning process. Life's activity in a clean body is called health. Life activity in unclean body is called disease. That's all there is to it. And to, in order to help the body become healthier, we have to give the body some ingredients to repair itself, to make it healthier body. The lost cells in the body has to be replenished with healthier cells. In our body, we have a heart, we have a kidney, we have lungs, we have so many parts of the body which don't operate independently. They all operate in conjunction with one another. So, if somebody says this is good for heart, this is good for lungs, this is good for brain, it doesn't mean anything in nature care. Is it good for health? Is it good for the whole body? That's what we have to see. If it is not good for health, it's not good for the body. There are medicines. Medicine, as the popular saying goes, is a sin of meddling with nature. When you meddle with nature, we face consequences that's not pleasant. When we help nature in a manner that our health becomes better, then we enjoy the life. 
every action has two reactions. Science says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yes, the opposite reactions are two. The, in Bhagavad Gita, it talks about prayas and shreyas. Prayas is the immediate reaction and shreyas is the ultimate reaction. Sarvasya dvaifale prayaha viruddhecha parasparam adau chalam phalam paschat phalam sthirataram bhavet adau chalam adau chalam phalam means immediate reaction is fleeting, is there only for a short time. But the ultimate reaction stays for a longer time. So more than this science, Vedantas have given us detailed explanation about action and reaction. It's not one reaction, they are two reactions. We have to take into consideration the ultimate reaction. If the ultimate reaction is bad, but immediate reaction good, don't take to that act that kind of action. So if eating a lot of uh, sweets, eating uh, our uh, spicy foods may be enjoyable in the beginning, but the ultimate reaction is unhealthy body. Unhealthy mind, both come out of unhealthy lifestyle. So unhealthy lifestyle should be avoided, healthy lifestyle should be adopted. Whatever exercise we do is painful in the beginning. Whatever salads or uh, fruits we eat may not be so enjoyable in the beginning. We are missing all those ice creams and pot puris and all that. But we are having to eat this fruit. We are having to eat the salad. That's what people in the beginning think. But this very salad, this very fruit becomes tastier when you adopt to healthy lifestyle. Wait until you become hungry. When you eat after you get hungry, the same vegetable tastes very, very good. I have said the stories of my journey to uh, uh, Maharashtra. In Maharashtra, I went to a place called Nanded, and I was told that I can get laborers for my brick factory from the village behind this hill, which was very close to us. But when we walked towards the hill, first time in my life, I saw the hills can also walk. Walk? What? How can hills walk? Hills is called hills are called achala. Achala means they don't walk. But this hill was just here, and I when I walk towards it, it's walking further and further and further. It's two and a half hours later I reached the bottom of the hill, and I touched the bottom to see it's not moving. Then I knew that we have reached the bottom of this hill. So the hill which was looking very close is actually not so close. When you, only when you walk under the valley and keep walking, then you know it's so far away. After walking two and a half hours, I asked the agent who was given to give me laborers, where is your village? He said, on the other side of the hill. Oh my God, I have to climb this hill now after walking two and a half hours? Oh, that's going to be difficult. Is there another way? Yes, you can walk around the hill three and a half miles and you can get to the village. Oh no, let's go up. Then I took my courage and walked up the hill, climbed the hill, and on the top of the hill, I see a wonderful scenery on the other side of the hill. What did I see? A stream coming down the hill and going under a shade of a big tree. Under the shade of the tree, a stream of water was also going. So when I saw that beautiful sight, I didn't care. I ran down. In life also, going down the hill is very easy. To climb up in life is very difficult. So I ran down and when I reached the stream, I kicked my shoes off. I didn't care it's mud or something. I just lie down, putting my feet, tired feet in the water and rested. When I rested in the uh, mud with feet in the burning feet in the water, I felt so good. It was heaven. Have you seen heaven? I did. I don't know how long I slept. I just went off. I was not myself. I was not dead. It was wonderful. After some time, I don't know how long, the boy, the man said, Sabuto, 
when he asked me to wake up, I woke up and I saw he was having a black pumpkin. What? He says, how? Come and eat. He was having a black pumpkin. What, how did the pumpkin become black? He burnt it with, in fire. The whole pumpkin, he put in some wood was burning there. He had put the whole pumpkin. Outside skin got burnt when he knocked it on the rock and broke it into two pieces. Inside was very green, yellow and not at all bad. So he started eating his half and he said, start eating yours. What? You just eat the pumpkin like that? I didn't know. I can never uh, think of that. So we know preparations out of pumpkins. We know preparations out of other wisdom. But to eat just a burnt pumpkin? But he says, try. So he gave me, a, made a spoon out of the cob of the pumpkin and I used it as a spoon. And I saw him eat using his own hands, eating the fruit and the seeds and everything chewed up and he, he was enjoying it. So I started eating. And I couldn't believe the tastiest dish that I have ever taken in my life. Because I walked two and a half hours without food. I rested under the tree, cooled my feet, and then I was fully rested and my hunger matured. This is what is called hunger maturing. Work hard, get rest. And after getting rest, then you get to enjoy the food. When my friends gathered sometimes discussing what is the best dish you ever eat, I said the burnt pumpkin, they all said you are crazy. <laughs> I said go to Nande, walk for two and a half hours, then eat this pumpkin, then you will know what it is. Go under the stream, go on the stream and put your feet there. All this experience is very, very good. Because even a simple, without I mean, subtle tasting vegetable, will taste very good when you work hard for it, allow the hunger to mature, and then eat. So, is, uh, I have a question here. At, yeah. I have a question here, doctor. I mean, uh, there is this whole, uh, if you see the narrative of, uh, you know, uh, I would say the pro dominant narrative of the day is actually uh, enjoying the food that we eat, not in the sense that you are saying, but enjoying the variety and that includes processed food. And uh, as we were discussing and preparing for this session, uh, one of the volunteers said that, you know, we all know the truth behind, let's say uh, a store cooked pizza, right? That it is not good for us, but when it comes in front of us with all the advertising and all the imagery that is associated with it, all our resolve not to eat it kind of goes for a toss. So why is it that while we may have heard of these principles of, you know, letting our hunger mature and eating only natural food and in a way keeping away from processed food, but when it comes to us in front of us, all of this goes for a toss. Why are we not able to commit to something we have learned? In a way, I am reminded of uh, Duryodhan, which says, Janami Dharmam, you know, I know the dharma, but I don't know activity in it. Or I know a dharma, nachame nivrutti. I know what is not, you know, irreligious. I know what is irreligious, but I cannot withdraw from it. So what is it that you find as an observation that a lot of people know about these principles, but there is this gap of not being able to practice what is being preached to us. And uh, yeah, your thoughts on this. I come across, uh, this is a very, very good idea to interrupt and ask questions. Because like, if you keep on speaking, it, you get to tend to get tired or bored. So in, uh, questions in between is very good. And this is such an important question. That's why we give the three P's. Three P's, P1 is plan. Then second P is provide. Third P is to prepared. I, my wife used to make salads for me, raw vegetable salad. One day I told her, can you put some more coconuts in this? She went and made, uh, grated some more coconut and added. Another day I said, can you put some more tomatoes in it? She went and brought some tomatoes and put it. On the third time she said, look, I have a great idea for you. 
I will let you make your own salad. How about that? You can add your coconuts, you can add your tomatoes, you can do everything and you can make your own salad. How about that? I was so happy. But when I went to make it, she gave another condition. Whatever you material you use, you should not leave it on the table, on the counter. Clean up everything, put it back and clean up the knives, clean up the food processor. And you should not look as if you, you used it at all. It should be like that. Then you can make your own. It used to take one hour for me to make my salad and eat. So later on, as I keep on planning and preparing my program, it became easier and easier and easier. Now I can make my salads in just 20 minutes, wash up everything, clean up and put it in the right place and start eating. It's just a plan and you should know step one, step two, step three. And if you have to write it down, write it down. This is what the salad I'm going to eat on Tuesday. This is going to be my salad on Wednesday. Prepare the recipe ahead of time. Buy the materials one day advance and keep it available. I have a bag which says Appa salad and I, that bag nobody will touch because they know this is my salad material. I take it from that bag, wash the vegetables one more time and grate the vegetables and make my salad. Now I know steps and it became easy. And once I know this routine, I, I can even do one more thing. That one more thing is sometimes I take a little heavier breakfast. Like it's in winter, I make almond milk and uh, mangoes. Uh, not mangoes, apples or banana. Banana shake with almond milk. It, that's like a relish and it's a little heavy on me. So my lunch will be delayed a little bit more. I have a right. I have freedom because I have to make my own salad. I take it 2.30. So by that time, my breakfast has been digested, hunger matured. And then I'm able to enjoy the salad. If you don't, then salad will, will be insipid no matter how much coconut you add. It's not going to be so nice. With hunger, with less coconut or less tomatoes, the salad will still be very tasty. These are the things which you have to make preparation. I have to do this dharma. I have to do this activity. So every day you mark your calendar or mark your paper, diary. And it's only for a few days few days you write and follow it and then you don't need the paper you don't need any reminder it becomes a part of your life you start doing that whatever good things you have to do in life you do like in the morning if i don't do my exercise and prayer i am not allowed to eat that's my own resolution so because i am not allowed to eat i somehow managed to finish my exercise my prayers so that i could eat because the condition is there so each of us can put a restriction for ourselves and create a bondage, bondage between us and good habits. And this is only in the beginning. Once you have practiced that for a few days or a few months, then you don't need any reminders. It's part of your lifestyle. Whether you're in a train or you're, you're in a house or you're in a hotel, wherever you are, your morning routine is set and you can do it. Sometimes it's delayed, but we cannot miss out on the exercise and sit for eating. That's the condition. So, but, so this is like, uh, what I understand is it's a call to change ourselves and change our lifestyle. And uh, the whole it's the whole package which comes. You cannot just have it piecemeal, you know. And that becomes very difficult for a lot of, let's say, urban folks who are working and who may not have the access to, let's say, making their own salad in their workplaces and so on. So that's one question I have in terms of how is it something which uh, can be made convenient to the modern lifestyle or is it, can it be, you know? And second is that it calls for a lot, does it not call for a lot of adjustments from our family or immediate family? Because, you know, for example, if I'm into eating, uh, something which is in line with nature cure, it means one more menu for my home kitchen. And, you know, it kind of, 
unless the whole family is into it, it becomes difficult to sustain this kind of uh, a lifestyle. So, do you have any comments on this? Examples from your yeah, family? Does we, your entire family also follow this routine, or is it like even, a lot of exception? We had the same problem in our family also. because daughter is going to work so daughter son in law is going going to work grandson has to go to school each of them have different demands and different requisitions so we usually resolve all family matters in family meetings every family should have a family meeting at least once in a week in that one meeting we discuss our problems and uh, pleasures first we start with meditation holding our hands together closing our eyes and chanting om and then going on silent meditation and then we our next step is to talk something good about the other member of the family each one of us have to think about it ahead of time that in the family meeting i have to appreciate this person or that person so this opportunity makes us more friendly with each other so unless we express our appreciation to other members of the family this bondage cannot be built up just taking it for granted he knows that's not good enough we should express it try to say it one day my uh, grandson was in a hurry to go to school but he said grandpa i have not done this homework i don't know how to do this sum i i was uh, yesterday i i we were we can we had gone out and we forgot and all those things so i left the cutting board where i was cutting the vegetables and i went to him and explained to him how to do it because i cannot do his all homework i have to make him do it i showed him a sample question i showed him the steps and he solved it immediately and he said thank you tata and he went away to his school before i could come back to my cutting board my wife came shouting see you leave everything like this and you leave me you leave it a mess and she wiped it and kept it and she didn't even know that i have to cut one more vegetable or not but she just wiped it and kept it but she just uh, gave gave a remark and went uh, in the family meeting my grandson was thanking me thank you tata for helping me yesterday with uh, my homework and you were cutting vegetables but because i was in a hurry you came and helped me thank you very much i i i got appreciation from my school for solving extra two sums <coughs> and all that he said then my wife realized oh oh i was just shouting at him and he didn't even argue about it. that's a great thing that you should do if if somebody is blaming you wrongly and you go and argue, no you don't know what it, what i did all that it's all waste when you shout at somebody and somebody is shouting at you and you shout back the uh, situation becomes worse just keep quiet at that time and smile anything i say you smile and you she will add one more remark and go but when my grandson explained this in the family meeting then she realized she, she was very wrong in having shouted at me and when her turn came she thanked me for being quiet at that time not giving her back although she was wrong so these are times every good act will be rewarded we don't have to be worried at all in the family we have all different requirements we know it so when we discuss it in the family this is what i need this is what i like likes and dislikes maybe their requirements maybe their each of us will take into consideration the others comfort and work accordingly the family meeting helps in so many ways and when it comes to criticizing other member there is also another way not to shout at the other person or say bad things but to say it in a manner that the other person receives it properly these are all intricacies of healthy lifestyle so when we when my daughter doctor stone came she was saying that my husband helps me in so many things he is very good and he also talks to me nicely but on the other day when i was saying you know having a good time with my friends we were laughing around he came and shouted at me that i should find his wallet and he is in a hurry to go and you are 
doing this and that, but he shouted at my at me in front of my friends. I excused myself from my friends and I went to his room and I found that his he had left his wallet in his coat. He didn't put it back in the drawer as he is supposed to do every day. When I took it out of his, I looked in the drawer. It was not there. Next, I looked into the coat, which he didn't. And he found that wallet and he said, okay, thank you. And he left without apologizing for rude manner in which he treated me with my friends. But that's okay. But he was in a hurry. She said, that's okay. And also explained what he did. I felt hurt. That's what she said. And he immediately said, oh, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have hurt your feeling. So there are ways of saying bad things about others without hurting the other person also. Just say, I was hurt. That's enough. So many times, our family wants to help us, but they are disturbed about certain choices that we make. Doesn't matter. Our policy is to encourage others whether wrong or right. That's our policy in the family. But when we want to discourage others or, or say something uh, that we don't like about the other person's uh, habit or certain practices, then we have to say it in a positive manner. That's what we were told in USA. We were given like a parenting classes. There is one class for parenting. And then family counseling, how to deal with husband and wife. Mm -hmm. So those classes, I thought was, why do I need it? I'm a matured man. I need, I know everything. That's what I thought. But my wife says, in USA, you cannot treat the children as you used to treat them in India, scolding them, beating them. That's not allowed. You have to come to your classes and you will know what to do. Otherwise, they will take away the children to a foster home and you will be arrested and kept in the jail for two days. All those things will happen in this country. She warned me and we went to a parenting class. Oh my God, there is so much to learn. We thought we are Indians, we know everything. But then simple things they taught us in classes helped us for a many, many number of years. Our relationship with our children became better and we became a happy family. These are simple things. These are all related to life natural. In life natural or nature cure, our behavior is very, very important to maintain. And when we are not able to follow a certain discipline, we should make a chart. Initial days, we have to make a chart and say what are the things that we are supposed to do. Write it down. And then mark whether you did it or not. If you did it, mark it, check it out. If you didn't, mark a cross and you do it for a week or two and then you don't need the chart then you know that you got so many crosses you got only few checks and checks and uh, debits get balanced and we know that we are to progress the progress chart will show you that's only needed for some time and later on you will automatically follow the right thing and until you until you come to a stage of having more checks than crosses, you have to follow the chart. And once you follow the chart, then it becomes easy. And then we have to discuss with the family also why we are making this choice. Like my son, for instance, told me that he, he, see, he takes salad for lunch and he sees uh, other colleagues eating cooked food and he gets disturbed. So he says, here is your salad I'm eating now. In the morning, he would eat the breakfast salad and he will take cooked food for lunch. When he's eating cooked food with others, he is not getting disturbed. And in the evening, he comes back home and takes a banana milkshake or a mango shake and he's that satisfied that for, that's enough for his dinner. So it, we can adjust, make front, one thing uh, later or earlier, we can arrange it but never take a cooked meal in the morning. You can cook, sh shift the cooked meal from lunch or dinner, but not for the breakfast. These are some of the rules we have to remember. And These are great son, tips, it, sir, actually. These are great tips, uh, especially when packaged with 
practices yeah. you do as a family so it's not yeah. just about a particular discipline that we have in our lives but we are kind of ensuring that the family works together and uh, that's that's i think the beauty of it in fact uh, one of the requests we have to make of you is for you to sing a song which is uh, your own creation uh, which brings out these principles of nature cure in a very fun kind of a way i'm going to put that up uh, on the screen here and i'm going to put up the whole song but you Beautiful. can choose which paragraphs to sing and uh, it will be lovely uh, i have been a part of one of your courses and i have seen how wisdom flows from kabir to meera to ram charit manas to the ancient texts and how all of this assimilates into some fun lyrics that you put together in this song so i am going to just put this up here and request you to sing this song for us it kind of gives a good picture of the various principles of nature cure and while we'll have dr sharma saying a few paragraphs of his choice at least we can all take a look at the very breath that is being covered in the whole of the song uh, so sir whenever you can yeah i'm i'm ready okay great so the song is here up on the screen please feel free to sing your favorite paragraphs and we can we can't enlarge it it's a nature cure song yeah no meaning in all your wealth if you have lost the treasure of health there is no beauty in artifice natural beauty is hygiene spice La 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 la. Me check your la 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 la. Me check your health and beauty is is for sure. That's it goes on and on. I have to do a lot of preparation to uh, sing it again all all along with you. But that's the idea. We have to all practice and sing it together. the first two lines are wonderful no meaning in all your wealth if you have lost the treasure of health there is no beauty in artifice natural beauty is hygiene spice so that was the line but uh, our team uh, part participants they included this la 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 and made it into a dance and they danced it and we are also planning to do it one more time in our group and we'll teach them So in the meanwhile, the all these songs. This song was composed by my father, Ganesh Sharma, and I set it to tune. Looking at a, a Spanish song, there was a Spanish song which is uh, uh, sung by somebody. No, no, it's Larry Belafonte. Larry Belafonte. Ah, uh, yeah, he sung that uh, down the way when the nights are gay, or something like that. so i like that tune and i put it in this song and it worked out very well so there is uh, so much music in our nature cure camps whenever we hold camps we make the patients forget that they are sick they come with so much sickness and so much worry and tension and we tell them to forget that they are sick we make them say a slogan that i am healthy i will to be healthier and that we engage them in so many activities for fun we make them fast for a whole day and during the fasting we make them sing and dance and uh, play games in between classes and games we have lessons values of ether values of fasting how easily it can be uh, done and how easily it passes there was a 21 days camp in delhi and where more than 105 people came and joined them and we went to went to through a half day fast one whole day fast and two days fast we when they saw it in the chart that we are going to do two days fast they were scared oh my god how can we do two days fast we came to enjoy different foods in the camp and they are saying two days fast that's what they thought when initially when we did half day fast they were surprised that they could do it those were people who have never missed a single meal and when they did fasting until 4 o'clock they were amazed 
the whole day went without knowing that we fasted and then when when we were to do one day fast we did a, a cooked meal for sunday lunch and skipped the dinner and it was easy for us to carry on to skip the dinner after having eaten cooked meal for lunch we could easily skip the dinner and we went on to fast for the next day until 4 pm and 4 pm we broke the fast with uh, fruits and in the night we had cooked meal again so that was one day fast then we went to one and a half days fast and then we went to two days fast when we did two days fast people could not believe they could continue two days fast this was easier than half day or one day we didn't know that okay dr sharma we are ready to fast for a third day they all voted for it but we said there's no provision for it because we have to wind up the camp after breaking this fast we have to take liquid diet and then we have to uh, come to the solid diet and all that so we didn't do it but the matter the matter is that everybody enjoyed two days fast and found that two days fast is easier than one day or half day fast unless you do it in a group it may be difficult in a group it was so enjoyable everybody did it together and that's why we hold camps where we all lead people through fasting and all kinds of exercise yoga the pranayama everything is done in a different style for example when in other schools of yoga they ask you to breathe in deep stretch breathe out and uh, breathe out and bend when you bend when you reach the final pose they are counting 1 2 3 and they are breathing in breathing out breathing in breathing out that's not yoga that is a acrobatics that's a display of skills but real yoga means you bend down breathing out and hold that posture as long as you can hold the breath if you are not able to hold the breath then you are changing the breath extend your body stretch it and breathe in and hold that posture until you can hold the breath inside breathe in when you are stretching breathe out when you are bending when you bend and breathe out hold that posture as long as you can hold the breath that is the real yoga that's what we teach all the yoga teachers who have gotten master's degree they come to our yoga our nature cure camp and when they do yoga oh they see this totally different they are not able to do it for long they did 25 counts they were doing bending down now they are not able to do it 10 counts because we said don't uh, breathe in you can you have to hold the breath after breathing out so real yoga is so a company pranayama along with every posture pranayama in, includes four parts one unit of pranayama has inhale hold exhale hold in this each step there are so many important things that's happening in the body when you are exhaling you have to exhale through the nose first and the remaining air you blow out through the mouth and exhale completely even if you exhale completely lungs will not be completely empty the some air will still be there because if all the air escapes lungs will collapse so even if you try you cannot remove all the air after you exhale you have to hold the breath now wonderful things happen in the body so when you are inhaling lungs are working when you are holding the breath inside the lungs lungs are working when you are exhaling lungs are working when you are holding the breath after exhaling lungs are resting you never give rest to the lungs like you never give rest to the thoughts when you give rest to the lungs you are not breathing you are holding the breath and you are spending that time happily you are living comfortably you are not struggling that means you have reduced the number of counts in your breath when they when somebody dies they say he breathed his last uski ask aakhri saans le li jaise kehte hain na dane dane pe likha hai khane wale ka naam in the same way every breath that's also been counted in your life 
you will breathe for so many times. That has been determined already. That's what is prana shakti. When you are holding the breath after exhaling, you are living but not breathing. You have not reduced the counts. So you this you are entering into a recurring deposit scheme in a bank. You get compound interest for this deposit. And if you deposit, say, 1,000 rupees every month, in the end of the year, you don't get 12,000, you get 15,000 rupees back. That's the compound interest you get back. In the same way, when we are exhaling and holding the breath, we are getting an interest, compound interest of living and not breathing. And this com compound interest accumulates and at the time when you are struggling, when in the last days of your life, this compound interest comes in handy and you are able to live that last few days comfortably. You are able to breathe extra because it's available to you. You didn't finish all the counts. So these are different wonderful things. But there is yet another benefit. What happens when you're holding the breath after exhaling? When you're holding the breath after exhaling, new files open up in the brain. Mm -hmm. Archive files. How does it happen? Because when you're holding the breath after exhaling, there is, uh, what do you call, different parts of the body where there is air packets. In the back of your body or your neck or your head, different parts of the body has air packets which has not been tampered for years. Because we are shallow breathers. We breathe a little bit, breathe out a little bit, and we are not expanding the lungs or contracting the lungs fully. So in this process, a lot of air packets are left without tampering in different parts of the body. <clears throat> when you're holding the bed for a longer time, after exhaling, all these packets of air in different parts of the body starts rushing towards the lung because the nature of air is not to leave any part of the body empty. The air will distribute itself in a room, in a certain house, if it is connected to different rooms, you keep removing the air from one room, air from other rooms will also rush to that air. The empty uh, air empty room to fill it up with air. That's the nature of air. Now when you're breathing out and holding the breath, to fill the air in the lungs, air from different parts of the body will rush towards it. The air packets in the brain, brain is called amygdala. Amygdala means walnut. If you have seen the shape of a walnut, brain is also of the sh same shape. There are crevices in the brain where there is air packets staying for years together. That air packets is tampered when you're holding the breath after exhaling. When you're holding the breath, air packets from the uh, crevices of the brain will kick the side and will rush to the place because they've been sitting idling there for a long time. They don't get out easily. You're holding the breath for a long time. Now the air is finding the emergency call, they come on, you also come, you also come. So they all have to get up from there. The air packets in the process will kick the sides and open up files. What are these files? They're called archive files. In computer, the files which you don't use, they go into archives. I'm looking on that side because there are some students who are also listening to the lectures. And these archive files will get opened. And information that is, you don't know that you have this information, they get become available to you. Your father, grandfather, great-grandfather has left some memories in your DNA. DNA is what? Such a small particle of blood. This small particle has got such a big story. In Washington, D.C., I saw a museum called Smithsonian Museum. In this Smithsonian Museum, there is a big glass tower. In the glass tower, there is a small window. In the window, there is a sign which says, there are 10,000 resistors in this glass tower. And this small window carries a small chip. Chip was this size. And he says, this one chip carries memories of all these resistors. 
good old days they used to use resistors and in good old days the first computer was big as big as a big room that was occupying all the space and later on the computer became smaller and smaller and smaller and now people are carrying a small cell phone which has got so much memory more than that those computers and we can't even sell those computers for trash and now the uh, technology has advanced so much that they are having more memory it, from megabytes to kilobytes kilobytes to uh, terab gigabytes and gigabytes to terabytes oh my god mind boggling ex- uh, improvement in technology so all that is we are wondering at even a small cell phone carrying such a small chip is able to make calls to usa or australia from india so many people are calling and all voices are going in there we can't see anything but the technology is so great your voice alone will go to the other person other people's voice are not going what's happening here i am also talking he is also talking but he is talking is to his aunt i am talking to my sister everything is going separately where is it going we can't see it. such wonderful things we come to know but when we say good old days rama traveled in a pushpaka vimana carrying oh, so many people from sri lanka to ayodhya we can't believe that they had the technology that when rama was in trouble in some some place the message reached dasharatha kaushalya his mother got up from sleep oh rama is in trouble how did they do all that telepathy tel- communication wonderful things were there those days which has value even today even today people have demonstrated it i have And, i have a question on that sir uh, yeah. and this is great like you know the way you have uh, opened up the field of nature cure not just in terms of the diet or the daily diet but you are talking about practices you are talking about involving the whole family as a unit and in the last few minutes you've been talking about uh, how every breath in fact a part of every breath the kumbhak that we hold is actually an opportunity for us to practice and all of that kind of like you beautifully said compounds and that compounded merit or benefit helps us right till the end of our mortal lives so how to make best use of this gift of life uh, not just not just on the basis of our daily diet but every single breath and every single relationship especially the close family relationships it's just beautiful sir and i really thank you for having gone into this great kind of a detail Uh, at this moment i would kind of take a brief uh, sort of uh, a break from the nature's health science and ask you some questions about your personal life and you know your grandfather uh, your life overlapped with his for a few years and we want to know a little bit of stories if you were to refresh your memory as to what are some of uh, you know your formative memories of your grandfather he of course like we spoke about was a freedom fighter a lawyer who left his practice for the freedom struggle a devotee of bhagwan raman maharshi as well as a vedantic scholar who left quite a few books on vedanta before he left his body so what are your memories as a grandson is there any story of your grandfather which continues to inspire you there are stories and stories so many of them i remember even as a small But something child, personal yeah even as a small child i remember my uh, father had a printing press in the house printing uh, publishing all nature cure books my father was an expert in printing he expert in photography he had his own photo studio in the town and they have taken so many pictures of mine as a baby and uh, displayed it he has got a slide projector in his uh, photo studio and he used in the good old days when there was this idea was new 
he made you know, his own slide projector, which uh, motorized slide projector, made of wood, and there's a belt which will carry the slides, each slide of different shops. Advertisements he used to collect from different shops. In his photo studio, nobody thought that a photo studio can operate in different manners. He, his studio was in the top floor, uh, second floor, and in the ground floor where his brother's shop was there. And his uh, evening time comes and he will start his slide projector on. Each shop's name will come with some pictures. He will design the advertisement and they will be displayed for some time and it will fall down. Another slide will come. It will be a continuous game. He had all those things in his photo studio. I remember as a small boy going to all those places in the market from the street, we can see all this projection. I used to wonder, how did he do all that on his own? And uh, my grandfather, I had spent a lot of time with him because every day evening when he goes for walks, I was the one chosen one to go walk with him. In the uh, younger days, he used to hold my hands in, when I grew a little big, bigger, I used to hold his hand so that he doesn't fall down. So all those memories I have, on the way walking, he will every day not be quiet. He will be telling me stories of Panchatantra and what is the philosophy behind each one. And just Not just stories. They are all philosophical stories filled with information and, and humor. So those are the things which I enjoyed in my younger days with grandfather. One of the very enjoyable trip was when I went to uh, walk with him and collecting some pebbles near the stream. There is a stream in the forest behind our house. My grandfather's house, house or the sanitarium was in the end of the town. Behind the house was a forest. So we used to go take a walk in the forest and to a stream. Where the stream comes, there is a lot of many pebbles will be there of different shapes. He, my grandfather will carry a small bag and I will pick the pebbles and put it in the bag. So we will uh, take a walk in the in the water also we will walk uh, because we walk barefoot and we can, used to come back home and put the pebbles outside his room. Those pebbles were there. I remember that very, very well. And I have a I had a cousin who was just six months older to me. And in my house, everybody said, he is my Anna. Anna means elder brother. So you have to call him Anna, you can't call him by name. That's a family tradition. Whoever is elder to you, you don't call them by name, you have to call Anna. He's my elder brother. He's just uh, same height as mine. He's not big. I have to call him Anna. I didn't like the idea, but they said, no, you have to do it. Don't call him by name. Vada, uh, all that. Jabe, abe. I said, ne bolna chahi. Although he's of the same height, he's your Anna. You have that was a punishment for me, but I agreed. But the other advantage is, he's a street smart fellow. He knows everything, everybody in the locality. He knows what, what's everybody's name. I didn't care who, who is what. I, I just go accompany him, that's all. So that fellow was a street smart fellow. During Dashera days, we used to go to different houses. He used to know. This Kamala Mami makes sundal. That uh, Saroja Mami makes uh, sweet rice today. Another Mami will make payasam, sweet rice, uh, kheer. He knows every house what their preparation is because he is the one who is running errands for many of them. And uh, in the evening, uh, during Dasara days, each uh, Tamil Nadu family, they have a decoration of their handicrafts which they make in their house. Originally, it started to display the handicrafts and paintings which they make in their house. But now it has become just a custom. They buy paints and dolls from the shop and they arrange it. I'm talking about good old days. There was so much of handicrafts and people were encouraged. And this tradition was originally meant to display their uh, skill. So that was a very good custom. But that purpose of the custom has to be maintained. People have to do that. So when we went to a certain house, he knows 
which which house to go first because end will be a payasam because he should he don't want to eat payasam in the beginning we will take sundal first and then pongal next and things like that and he knows how to eat in different places when you go to you go to different houses you don't eat slowly chewing your food i am told my my uncle uh, my father elder brother that you have to chew your food thoroughly and he made me practice so much that i could not eat fast at all so when i got my sundal i was sitting and chewing and chewing slowly he has already finished two handfuls of sundal he said come on finish fast we have to go to the other house and give it to me then he will take it and he will eat it fast and go and ask for some more they will give you more and he said i said no they have already seen me taking it they know me <laughs> so he said doesn't matter hide behind this uh, pillar and then put two hands together when i went to the pillar and put my hand around the pillar and put my hand together and that man who was serving sundal he knew what i am doing he put the sundal in my hand now i can't take it out i am moving this way and that way and if i remove my hand separate all the sundal will fall away so he knows he is watching the fun he is okay give it to me take it out and then come out i'll give you both handful he he puts the sundal no i, I so, thank you when i come out and so my cousin is, he takes so there, all there the sundal a, uh, go ahead sir go ahead sir sundal is a chana ha huh. steamed chana and sorted and chanched with rai and curry leaves and all that very tasty dish with coconut dr- dressing so i usually am a slow eater but he says okay okay you had dinner he takes all the sundal and eats it fast and go to the next house next house next house like that we went to at least 10 houses had a handful of different uh, prasadam and when we come back home we have to have a dinner then we have our dinner also and in the night if when we go to sleep i have to listen to stories from him he will narrate the stories of movies which he has not seen but his friends told him the story and he will narrate with full action he kicked him like that he kicked him like this and all those he will disclaim display and i have to say mm, mm, mm. if i don't say he says hey you are not listening so i have to say who he is my anna that was the uh, way we used to spend our nights that's great and that's great we so there is one sleep. one question we wait, have wait, sir wait 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 <laughs> one most important part of it is coming <laughs> when we went to sleep about around 9:30 pm he started howling and crying with severe pain in the stomach so i am trying to wake him up he is not waking but he is crying so i went and called my father in a joint family it's not necessary to call his father mm-hmm. when my father goes on tour my uncles are there i never miss my father he goes on tour again and again congress meeting in karekudi congress meeting in tisnapalli around pudukote we were having so many congress activities he was a full time congress devotee and he was full time what do you call freedom fighter so his studio was l- losing money but he didn't care about that but he we never missed him because i have my uncles everybody is telling me hey just start do this don't do this or oh, everybody is guarding me and protecting me aunts are there uncles are there so we never miss anybody his father may go out my father may go out but we have everybody protected in the joint family when i called my father to help him out he is crying my father tried to wake him up he is not waking but he is crying so he carried him to a table and made him lie down and gave him a tona tona is to a mini enema so we gave him an enema and put him in the toilet we held him with both his hand he cleared his bowels and then he washed him and put on the nicker made him lie down he slept he kept slept, sleeping throughout he never knew what's happening he didn't wake up at all and in the morning when he woke up i told him what a severe pain you had yesterday who had pain i didn't have any pain what are you talking about he didn't even know that he had so much pain that's what tona is all about magic jadu tona 
So we, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that's what we have seen and cannot forget those experiences in the more in the early part of my life. So your question, you were saying something. So the question was a couple of questions uh, we are getting on our feed. One is the question that. Uh, uh, in line with what you were, you know, sharing your childhood experiences, that were you the only grandson of, you know, uh, Acharya Lakshman Sharma who took this forward, or were there, you know, your other cousins who also taken it forward? That's the first question. And the other question is slightly more in line with what's happening around in the world, and uh, in line with what you were expressing at the beginning of the talk: uh, is medicine bad? And what is your view on the vaccinations for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is happening? So one question in continuation with the family stories you were sharing and the other one with what's happening around the world right now. I wish you would ask the second question a little later again, because they are not mixed uh, together. Yeah, yeah. So let me answer the first question. That is, uh, you repeat the first question again, please. Uh, the question was, are you the only grandson of Acharya Lakshman Sharma who has taken this forward? Uh, are you the only child in that family who learned to eat slowly <laughs> without being told to do so? Because, you know, uh, at least I am a city born guy and I want to eat everything fast. If I like something, I want to even eat it faster. So the instinct is to kind of, you know, go and enjoy it. And enjoyment is equated by eating faster. So how do you reverse that uh, in your head? And how were, were you wired differently from your cousins and so on right from the beginning? Yeah, I, there was one more cousin who also joined the movement. He, is, he also start, started spreading, but unfortunately he died uh, when at the age of his 60 years. And uh, I'm the only one left over to continue this mission. All other cousins took to other occupations and uh, uh, they were not doing this. Some of most of them have died, and some of them who are younger to me, they are living. And one one cousin sister who is elder to me, she is also living. And most of them uh, are following nature cure to their own lifestyle, but they don't want to spread to others. Even my children, uh, when they get sick, they don't take medicines. They take a tona and fast for the day, and they're all right. My grandson also does the same. But to go out and preach, my sons are not ready yet. My second son is the only one who is showing so much interest in nature cure, spreading the message. He writes articles and puts it in our website or LinkedIn. And he wrote an article three years ago uh, uh, predicting the pandemic that's going to come in the world. And he wrote an article in LinkedIn later on uh, when the pandemic really came, they took his article out. I don't know who did. All those things are happening in the world. But he is the one who told me not to criticize the medical world. All the children got together and told me every nature to your book that is in the world or the natural hygiene book, they are filled with 40% of criticizing, criticizing medical industry. And the first part is criticism. And then they tell something about nature care. But in your life, we want you to not to criticize medical people, just to tell people what nature care is all about. So that's what I did. And when I saw his article, I asked him, you are advising me not to criticize the medical world and you are doing it? He says, no, this is not just the medical world. This is another serious conspiracy going on from industry to industry, creating this pandemic which is going to come at a later time. So he made some research and found it alarming information and he put it together and warned the world that this pandemic is coming. In 1950s, when the smallpox vaccination came, Jenner who found the vaccination, he stole the thesis of Besham, another colleague of his, they were both partners in, in a research work. And without doing much of the work, he stole the research and changed the hypothesis. Hypothesis was original hypothesis of Besham was that 
filth you cannot promote health it will produce more disease that's his uh, original hypothesis he changed the hypothesis to other other ways and the pre introduced vaccine as a solution for smallpox and because of his extensive uh, thesis he was given knighthood knighthood means it's a reward given by queen of england to excellent uh, performance of their citizens english people so he was given a sir title uh, then he was uh, already proud about it all the medical world accepted it and they were promoting vaccination there was one state in england who did not take this because they were giving funds to buy vaccine government was given funds to buy vaccine and give vaccinate people that one state stockholm or some place they did, they decided not to use this fund for vaccine but they decided to improve the hygienic condition in that state every house should be clean every person should be clean they made sure that garbage is taken out disposed in the right place and they improved the hygiene of the uh, that state amazingly that one state was the only place where there was no case of vaccine, smallpox all other states had more so many smallpoxes and people died of smallpox it was becoming a big uh, threat and this vaccination did stop, stop smallpox but it started 40 different kinds of more serious diseases in the world which is incurable even today we are suffering from children of autism and autism is one of the side effects of smallpox vaccination everybody knows that but they are talking so much about smallpox vaccination that it eradicated smallpox from the face of the world it's not true there is actually the principle of action and reaction always working its way in the background and every in some sense are you saying that everything has its side effect although we enjoy the benefit we should not overlook the side effect we are not enjoying the benefit that's what i want to say when it eradicates one disease we are not eradicating disease from our life we are putting more diseases when whenever we have a pain i used to have a friend let me come to that this story later but let me go to the uh, vaccination and pre present day world crisis that part let me cover and then come back to the story at a later stage we all know that hygiene promotes health like the stockholm improved the hygienic condition and they improved the health condition of people and they were saved from smallpox we all know hygiene promotes health and we all should know that vaccine is a product of filth how do they manufacture vaccine if you trace the internet nowadays all the information is available but at the outside when you try to search they will give you some information but that will not be enough you have to go search further more further more further more and finally they will say it's made of virus the fight to fight one virus there it's made of virus virus is a product of filth how does virus come into being it's a product of filth when food rots when um, dirt uh, accumulated filth is rotting in the body that from that comes virus and they inject that into the body in order to eradicate a certain disease it was called at one time cholera and then later on it was called malaria then it was called diphtheria it was called so many other tuberculosis and different names were given to these diseases but all these diseases together show us what that there there is filth in the body that's the only message that we have to get all the virus flourishes on filth what is that food filth if there is no food in the body they are not they are not there anymore they go away. then next element of danger in this is fear fever, fear kills more than the fever that's a proper saying 
even if the fear is, fever is not killing you, fear will kill you. So they put fear in people's mind. In the whole world, they keep on talking about so many deaths with Corona, so many people died and all these things they see and create fear. And some people who don't have any symptoms at all, they get declared as Corona positive. And the person who has got all the symptoms, he is declared as Corona negative. Look at that. Where do you come up with all such results? What does it show? That nobody knows what Corona is all about. They don't know how to treat Corona. They try this medicine, that medicine, if the patient doesn't survive, they say he died of corona. So many deaths of corona. Where did they die from? Wrong medication. Everybody knows and they don't want to talk about that. And if we talk, we are boycotted from the internet. We are boycotted from every uh, web, common website that we have in public. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and whatnot, Instagram, so many places, YouTube, when there is a group of allopathic doctors, very well educated allopathic doctors whose consciousness calls them and tells them to tell the truth. They came out in the open and challenged the government, challenged anybody and everybody who can prove that vaccination can save, who can prove that coronavirus is the cause of all diseases. They can neither prove this nor prove that. They said anybody who proves will get 50 lakhs of rupees. They challenge in the open. Nobody is taking the challenge up. Can't we see from that what the truth is all about? That's a bit, uh, I would say that uh, quite, a, quite a strong message, I would say, for uh, the whole uh, community, especially the mainstream dominant uh, narrative of... Uh, let's say allopathic medicine. And uh, while we have a very short time with you now remaining, I would like to point to just one question which yeah. is coming towards the end from Pallavi, who is uh, wanting you to shed light on the spiritual basis or the spiritual side or quest of your life. And she's asking if you could shed some light on the topic of duality within us. And I remember from our conversation as a preparation to this call two days ago, where you kind of impromptu started singing na karmana na prajaya dhane na tyage naike amrutatva mana shuhu. So in the light of that chant, as well as the hymn from the Vedas and this question from Pallavi, any parting comments as to what are your comments on this duality within us? And it will be lovely if you could chant again that shloka and that hymn from for us. Na karma na na praja yadhane na tyake naike amratatva mana shuhu kar pare na na kam nihitam guhaya vibhraja te tatyata yo vishanti edanta vijyana sunishchitartha sanyasa yoga tyata yashuddha sattva E Brahma loke to paranta kale paramrata parimuchan to serve. Aram vipapam paravishma bhutam yet pundari kam puramadesa gustam. Atrabhita haram gaganam vishokas taspin yadan tasta dupasit of yam. Yo veda dos were approto. Edante no matter what we do, there are things we know, there are things we don't. What we know is, compared to what we don't know, is a very, very small quantity. Even that, what we know, is not really fully known. We think we know something about our body. We know a lot about our body, we think. But we, whatever we know is nothing. We understand that the body can heal itself, but we think we have to help the body to heal itself. When we leave it alone, without any help, body heals itself 
but it gives you trouble, gives you pain. We don't want the pain. So we want to relieve ourselves with the pain. So in order to relieve ourselves from the pain, we introduce medicine or remedies. They say uh, it's only a plant product. This is a good remedy. So they introduce remedies. And that's become a grandfather, grandmother's uh, treatment. No, it has been there for years. So that's accepted. Any wrong practice followed by a large number of people for a number of years becomes accepted as norm. It's a strange situation. It's a wrong practice. We know it. That when a woman becomes widow, we make them shave the head, we make them wear white, we make them not come to important occasions. What about the man? If he loses his wife, he's not given the same dishonor. A widow is considered bad spirit for the whole auspicious occasion. These are all wrong practices. Not one, not two. There are so many. I, in USA, I used to, uh, I had to work as a priest also because there was no priest in the community. And later on, priests came. In such communities, when I acted as priest, there was occasions when I had to conduct some wedding. A certain girl said, I don't want kanyada. I said, why? She says, what is kanyada? You're giving me as a charity to somebody? I am educated, I am earning money, and I am quite capable of not only taking care of myself, but I can take care of my husband also. I don't, my father is not alive. My uncle is supposed, supposed to do kanyadan. I don't want kanyadan. Let's cut off that ritual. I said, wonderful. Did you know that there are so many other rituals which you may like to cut down? When I explained to her, it was a male chauvinistic ritual which removed, uh, put the darba on the forehead and throw it off three times, saying that they are removing the evil spirit from your head because you are coming from another family to this family. What about your evil spirit, the husband's? Mm -hmm. So we don't consider these things as wrong because it's been practiced for long. Turmeric. And like that, turmeric has been practiced for so many years. My grandfather used it, grandmother used it. It has been good. Boil the turmeric and milk and your coughing stops. So many things which are wrong are insisted and they fight against you if you say anything wrong about that. These are wrong practices we should know by analyzing them. Then when we follow our dharma, dharma is also something which we have to understand in a little greater depth. But just, course, just uh, for the just, lack uh, of time, just, yes, sir. Just flagging off that we are already over time by three to four minutes. It will yeah, be lovely if you, if you could uh, <laughs> tell us the essence of it. Uh, maybe in one minute, uh, you were talking about Dharma. Yeah. When we say, follow the righteousness. And, and we say so many sayings. It is not what you read, but what you remember makes you learn it. It is not what you, uh, uh, what you, uh, eat, but what you digest gives you healthy. It is not what you preach, but what you practice makes you righteous. And it is in the same way, we have to understand if we are preaching something and if we don't practice it, you're not righteous yet. So if I teach nature cure to others and if I don't practice, that's no good at all. At one time I had eczema in my leg and I had just come back to nature cure after giving it up for a long time. And my cousin pointed out, the physician heal thyself. Look at the eczema in your feet. You are wearing socks and going, giving lectures. So as I remembered his pointing out, I agreed. I said, yes. I worked on it and it took three months and got completely cured. It had a clean skin. And then uh, now that it is cured, I asked it, I started eating some violation. Again, it came. Reminding me, look, when you take the discipline, you have to follow it continuously, not just for showing the world. So everything comes to you as a reminder and we have to follow it. In the same way, I have told you the stories of when I went to a supermarket with my son. I love cashews, particularly roasted cashews with pepper in it, salt and pepper. Wow, I love it. And when in that supermarket, they did this bad thing. 
as soon as the sliding door opens and you go in before you enter that main part of the supermarket there are so many baskets filled with different kinds of nuts all enticing and attracting and calling your attention i am with my son 12 year old and my hand is not even asking my permission it's going right away to grab some cashews my son says dad you didn't pay for it oh my god i got a slap on my face as if and he didn't slap me but a small boy telling you not to steal oh my god and then i had to adjust myself to keep my respect i said you are right but i want to see if this is good or that's good how can we know which one to buy it is okay you count the number of cashews he eat and tell the counter to add some money or did i take away so much cashew from your stock i said that's a good idea just to satisfy my just to keep up my respect i bought 50 grams of cashew that day we had cashews in the house <laughs> we <laughs> just had to save my name that's so a great story I, sir when that's i went ho- went to the counter to pay that the he was looking at me when it came to cashews he is looking at me so i said uh, ma'am i took some cashews to taste you can take out so many pieces or charge me extra he said uh-huh. be soft they have seen everything in the television they are keeping the cashews so that people will eat they want more customers to come there this is their advertising technique so when i asked him she said okay it's all right and i looked at my son he said okay <laughs> then then wow. i went home in the house my wife said why did you buy cash we have it in the house <laughs> i said don't ask me now don't spoil my name now i will explain it to you later so each one of us the next time i went to the same shop and my son was not with me my hand went again to the cash and now my intelligence came into action oh your son is not here so you are taking it why are you looking at me my mind is my hand is telling my intellect i'm only looking at you i'm not stopping you go ahead go ahead and eat it okay i don't want it. i left it and i could control myself wow so if we pause a little bit before we yeah. do anything wrong our intellect will come into action and we can stop ourselves and save ourselves of great wrong things sins that we end up doing we are all human beings we are filled with weaknesses so it doesn't matter we are also filled with strength that's what we have to remember life that's is an opportunity life is an opportunity to correct ourselves correct ourselves and keep correcting ourselves doesn't matter it's a game play it well that's, that's all beautiful matters. that's a beautiful story sir to end this conversation and a remarkable honest expression of how we can learn from our kids and uh, how we can learn from every moment if at all we have the opportunity and we grab that opportunity of distancing the instincts of you know falling prey to our instincts and just seeing that there is an option available not to fall prey to it so thank you so much for that expression that stories from your childhood and this whole the body of your work which expands not just in the field of nature cure but as you explain if we want to do it well it has to permeate every single breath every single close relationship and indeed become a way of life thank you for showing us this light excuse sir excuse me for excuse me for one minute okay i can i take this opportunity to uh, share with the with your audience that we are getting more and more opportunities to expand the horizons of nature cure and the way of asking us being asked to conduct a full degree course of 5 and a half to 6 years in nature cure training this natural health science is parallel to naturopathy but it's different from naturopathy because it's completely derivative from the vedic science another interesting thing is in chennai there is a very big ashram called ram rajya in that place they have hospital and the swami ji uh, what's his name uh, shiv shankar baba 
he has blessed us and he has asked us to go ahead and start a nature cure hospital there and there we are taking a team of volunteers and trainers a trained persons to start a one week nature cure health camp from the 18th of may for 7 days so there we are we are going to be treating people training people and pe- people who have been already trained they will be given classes for professional practice of nature cure and this professional practice doesn't mean that we are going to claim that we are going to cure diseases professional practice only means taking the responsibility of guiding people through natural healthy lifestyle that's all so i'm wanting more and more people to know about our activities and uh, log in to our facebook pages and uh, uh, write emails and get in touch and get if more people want to join us we are welcome in polachi i will be here until 16th of may and there are so many people who are not coming because of pandemic or corona or problem or lockdown but some people have come and if we, if you want to come you are welcome Oh, thank you thank you so much uh, dr sharma for your time and uh, also thank you for all the arrangements you and your team made so that you could be present here i would like to invite our audience for a minute of silence and while that silence is take to offer a song as as we part thank you so much I have been up I am grateful share the blessing hallelujah I have been up I am grateful share the blessing Hallelujah, may all be fed, may all beings flourish, may all awaken, Bodhisattva, may all be fed, may all beings flourish, may all awaken, Bodhisattva, I have been up, I am grateful, share the blessings, hallelujah, I have been up, I am grateful, share the blessings, hallelujah. May all be fed, may all beings flourish, may all awaken, Bodhisattva. May all be fed, may all beings flourish, may all awaken, Bodhisattva. Thank you.